My name is John Heisenbuttle. I'm a professional forester for life. Uh, since moving back to uh, California, I've also become a community organizer because I hope to be president one of these days. Okay, well, let, let's start with why I decided to become a forester, which uh, began uh, with active participation in the Boy Scouts uh, since I was eight years old and a Cub Scout. Uh, I uh, also went hunting with my, my dad almost every weekend, so it was in the outdoors. I love the outdoors and uh, decided that that's the place I wanted to be. Uh, one of uh, my pals in Boy Scouts was a few years older than me, and uh, he went into forestry. His name is Steve Wired. And I really looked up to Steve, and I hate to say that because Steve may see this. Um, and anyway, uh, seeing him go into forestry and talking to our scout troop uh, really inspired me to to go on and go on and uh, get my degree in forestry from Humboldt State University, the number one university in the United States. Um, uh, from, after graduating from Humboldt, uh, Steve Wired offered me my first job as a log scaler and assistant forester for Louisiana Pacific in Alder Point. I moved from there to uh, American uh, Forest Products Company in uh, Martell, California, where uh, early on I was a, a log scaler, a measurement specialist, and uh, uh, ultimately went on to manage about 30,000 acres of their land and do all the procurement and policy work for the for the company. It uh, it was the policy work that really showed me that I had the gift for BS because I operated in in uh, Sacramento and you needed to be able to speak, you needed to be able to write. So and not many foresters know how to do that. So that that was the early years, uh, about 11 years with American Forest Products Company. I was born in Daly City, California, so uh, the big city that's right adjacent to uh, San Francisco. And uh, like I said, uh, heavily involved in scouts, heavily involved in hunting and fishing with my dad. So out outdoors was a big part of my life. Um, went, went to high school at uh, Westmore High in Daly City. I went to junior college at College of San Mateo. Unfortunately, uh, College of San, Ma San Mateo had an excellent forestry professor, a uh, Cal grad, who uh, uh, taught excellent forestry classes and really prepped me for, for going to Humboldt State. Okay, life at Humboldt State. Uh, incredible experience, uh, both the education and and the fun, uh, uh, all, all the all the stuff we did away from school. Um, I transferred there from a, a two-year college. Uh, fortunate to have a, a forestry profession pro professor at that uh, two-year school, the College of San Mateo. So I, I, I went into Humboldt with. A lot of background in forestry. Uh, became very active in the Humboldt Forestry Club, uh, another networking opportunity. Uh, made uh, long-term friends there, uh, primarily through the, the 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 logging competition. We we had a, a team there, practiced every day. Uh, got very good. We, we actually won the, the first uh, competition at, at uh, Conclave in 1976 uh, that had been dominated by uh, University of Montana for years and years and years. So proud of that. I'll show you some of my trophies. Uh, uh, in, anyway, made, made a, a, a lot of long-term uh, friends there, people like Tom Schultz, uh, uh, Gary Reinerson. Uh, we, we keep in 
uh, close contact today. We after school after we all graduated, we uh, uh, we continued our our logging competition, doing the professional circuit for a for a couple of years, making enough money to to buy beers and hotel rooms and uh, just just have a, a fun time for the weekend. Uh, Want to mention a a couple of professors that really uh, were in influential to me. Uh, Bill Sice, who uh, uh, did did statistics uh, and mensuration. Uh, Jerry Partain, who was head of the the department and almost kicked me out of school for drinking a beer while the president of the university was giving a speech to the forestry class. And uh, Theron O'Dell, who was uh, my dendrology professor, tough son of a bitch, but a, a nice guy. And uh, uh, kept in contact with, with all of them, although uh, Jerry just passed this, this year or, or so. Anyway, Humboldt was a lot of fun, both the extracurricular activities as well as the, the classes. Ultimately, uh, for American Forest Products Company, I, I uh, did all the log procurement for the, the three mills we owned at the time, and I represented the company in, uh, in Sacramento with uh, the, the various trade associations before the Board of Forestry with the state legislature. And uh, that type of work really attracted me bec because I got to write, I got to uh, speak publicly. I, I like that a lot. And if you think about most foresters, they, they don't get into the forestry profession because they want to deal with people. They, they want to be out by themselves. So I, I, I had, a, a, I thought, a unique opportunity because I, I was comfortable speaking and writing. Okay, next next step uh, was Washington D.C. Uh, when you interviewed Anne yesterday, it, uh, she told you about her being laid off by the company Reduction in Force in 1986 or 1987. Uh, she got laid off. I got a big promotion. Uh, so I, I was re really moving with the company, but Anna and I were had just started dating, and we were starting to get serious. She found a job in D.C. Uh, there, there was really no hope for her getting a job back here. So I, I decided to uh, pull up my roots and move to D.C. and play in the big leagues of uh, of B.S. since I had played in the minor leagues in, in Sacramento, California. Uh, I, I went out there without a job and uh, uh, had, a, had a little consulting gig with uh, P&M Cedar uh, to hold me over, but uh, had, had to go out there and, and look for work, which uh, uh, was, was really interesting because my bride-to-be had a a uh, good, solid, good-paying job, and uh, I essentially had nothing. But ultimately, I, I hooked up with uh, Ameri uh, American Forest Council, which was part of National Forest Products Association. Uh, started out as a consultant for them. Uh, ultimately, worked my way up to the ranks uh, to become uh, a vice president of of forestry and wood products, which meant I was in charge of uh, policy for the forest products industry ac across the country, internationally, uh, was also responsible for uh, promotion of uh, wood products internationally, and uh, uh, codes and engineering, uh, the American Wood Council, which uh, uh, helps the country develop codes for building houses, building uh, wood buildings anywhere. The, 
my first job in D.C. was with the American Forest Council, which was part of National Forest Products Association. Ultimately, National Forest Products Association merged with the American Paper Institute and became the American Forest and Paper Association. Uh, so really the same organization. And I, I just moved up the ranks within that organization to uh, uh, ultimately become uh, part of the senior management team. Uh, the last six years I was there at, as vice president of, of forestry and wood products. Some of, the, some of the major issues we worked on, uh, on, on public lands, uh, when, when, when I first started at, at American Forest Council and uh, NFPA, uh, the, the spotted owl was in its heyday. So uh, it, it, it was what we called the forest wars, uh, where the, the spotted owl was really the surrogate. It was really about managing public forest lands. And that, that, that's an issue we argued about my, my whole 20 years there. And uh, there was a big sea change uh, uh, during, my, during my tenure in, in, in DC. Uh, the Forest Service moved from an organization that actively managed their forest lands to an organization that passively manages their forest lands. And, and uh, so, so at the end of my career in DC, uh, we, on public lands, we weren't talking so much about timber harvesting levels. We were talking about reducing the hazard of fires. So that was a big evolution on public lands. On private lands, uh, one of the big issues we dealt with was the Endangered Species Act and uh, uh, protecting landowners' ability to, to manage their lands. Uh, something I, I, I don't believe a whole lot of, lot of people appreciate is about 70% of the forest lands in the United States is, is privately owned, 20% uh, by industry, and uh, a, a little over 50% by non-industrial private landowners, uh, people like you and me that own an acre or two of, of private land. And the, the Endangered Species Act significantly affected private lands, not just the spotted owl, but in the south, it was the red cockaded woodpecker and uh, whatever the species of the day was. But that was a, that was a very big issue for, uh, for AFPA. People that don't work in D.C. automatically believe that everybody that works in D.C. is a lobbyist. I, I was a registered lobbyist, I think, for the first year I was there. Uh, but after that, uh, we had a whole department at AFPA that, that was strictly lobbyist. Uh, they did the work. They did the work on Capitol Hill, asking people how to vote. And that's the difference between a lobbyist and what I did. I educated people. I didn't ask a, a member of Congress to vote a certain way. So uh, in that way, I, I, I wasn't a lobbyist. Uh, it, as far as the day-to-day -day activities, it was, in association work, it's all about uh, getting the members to come to consensus on a certain position or a, a certain strategy for advancing that position. So get the membership together, uh, develop a strategy, and and execute. And execute means uh, communications, trying to trying to get your position made in the in in the media in some way. Uh, working Capitol Hill, uh, getting into to public debates and, and advocating your position so you, you could ed educate everybody as to where industry was, why it was logical, and uh, uh, hoping to uh, win, win the day on that particular strategy. Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Uh, 
probably the not probably it was it it, it was the highlight of my uh, career with the with the forest products industry. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be named as the the lead staff person to work with the industry to develop the sustainable forestry initiative with the the SFI what the SFI was all about was uh, attempting to demonstrate to the public that the forest products industry was willing to change the way it it does business what what happened as largely as a result of the the uh, forest wars and the 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 spotted owl is industry lost its credibility with the public uh, in the, in the in the public opinion research we we conducted uh, a majority of the public felt that industry was part of the problem rather than part of the solution and we knew we needed to flip that around and the only way we were going to do that again based on lots of public opinion research was 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 not a PR campaign not a a, a, a slick slogan or anything like that we needed to change the way we practice forestry across the United States so uh, God bless them uh, the industry got behind it uh, industry CEOs from across the country decided we're going to do it. We're going to make a change. And what uh, the SFI uh, started out, out as is a, a strict code of conduct for how industry operated. And it became a condition of membership within the association. If, if you didn't comply with the SFI, uh, you got the boot. And uh, uh, one, one of the the most successful uh, advertising campaigns we had about the SFI was a picture of a boot and uh, pointing out that we, we kicked out 12 members of the association for noncompliance with the SFI. And uh, that that's when I knew industry was serious because uh, what they were doing was giving up dues money uh, for the for the good of the industry as a whole, uh, it, SFI is now totally independent from uh, AFPA. It, it's 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 its own 501c3 organization, run by an independent board and independent staff. Uh, Bill Banzaf, the uh, former uh, chief executive of Society of American Foresters, was the first president and chief staff person for the SFI uh, back in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, and and the, the, the program has just grown. It's about 200, 200 million acres now in both the United States and Canada. Uh, the, the SFI label uh, can, be, can be seen all over the place. If you, if you look at Safeway bags, uh, the bottom of it uh, points out that it's been produced by a uh, SFI certified company. Uh, so it, 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 I'm very proud of the fact that we we really made a difference in the way forestry was practiced in, in the U.S. through the SFI program. Really, there's there's only two certification programs in the United States. There's, and I'll talk about the the, the other ones internationally. But the, the two programs in the United States are uh, the SFI and the Forest Stewardship Council (FSC). Uh, uh, early on, uh, there was a major war but between the two programs. Uh, most of the environmental organizations. Got beyond the, got behind, the uh, FSC early on, and uh, thought it would be beneficial to detract from the SFI in in order to advantage the FSC. Very frustrating because both both programs sought to in, improve and recognize uh, best forest management. Uh, over the years, uh, most of us have, have got 
over that and uh, uh, FSC and, and SFI live pretty compatibly within the, within the U.S. and competition is a great thing. Uh, one, one of the last papers I, I wrote for the American Forest and Paper Association was the, the advantage of a duopoly. Uh, having two uh, significant uh, forest certification programs in, in the United States, in, in North America, was a good thing because we were both improving in order to outdo the other. Competition's a good good thing. Uh, a monopoly would not have been. So uh, anyway, that, that's FSC. Internationally, there's a program called the, the Program for the uh, Endorsement of Forest Certification, PEFC, uh, which is an umbrella organization that, that recognizes uh, individual certification programs around the world, so that if you're if you're uh, selling products overseas from the U.S., uh, PEFC recognizes uh, your label and promotes your label, so so that all the programs coming together help one another. SFI is recognized by PEFC and. Uh, uh, Forest Stewardship Council uh, is an international program unto itself, so they, they promote themselves uh, internationally by themselves. SFI and FSC are means to differentiate yourself. If, if anybody thinks or thought they get a price premium for being certified, uh, think again, because it, it doesn't happen. You differentiate your project, your product, as, as being managed in a superior way. And folks like Home Depot say, okay, we're gonna purchase yours over somebody that's not certified. Uh, same price, but you're the one we're gonna buy from. So it, there, there, there really isn't a premium, ex except in real niche markets. At, at SFI just, just uh, celebrated its uh, 20 year anniversary a couple years back which which was just awesome uh, they they brought together all the the founders if you will from uh, uh, different companies and all the staff people that helped out that was a lot of fun and it, it was really heartwarming to to see the success of the program and it's self-funding now it, it, it it's just incredible In, in my job at, at the American Forest and Paper Association, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to be responsible for international forestry, which offered me the opportunity to travel to places I never thought I'd ever get to go. I mean, Australia, New Zealand, China, Turkey, uh, Switzerland, Sweden, Finland, Russia, uh, just, just incredible. And uh, uh, one of my roles with AFPA it was uh, representing the as association uh, with the United Nations. So I was able to sit on several uh, UN delegations for in, in important forestry programs uh, that the UN was working on. Not, not the least of which was the. Uh, the Earth Summit. Thank you. Uh, anyway, the 1992 Earth Summit, the the very first Earth Summit uh, ever conducted by the UN. It was down in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I, I worked on the U.S. Uh, delegation and all the preparatory meetings leading up to uh, to Rio, and uh, then I, I spent three weeks down there during the actual Earth Summit. I was not on the U.S. delegation there, but because I had been on so many U.S. delegations, I, I got to stay in the, the hotel with with the U.S. Dell and with the president and several senators, which which was uh, great fun, uh, a, a real experience. Uh, subsequent to the 
to the uh, Earth Summit, uh, served on uh, several uh, uh, U.S. delegations to the U.N., uh, developing principles and criteria for sustainable forestry, uh, uh, which was called the Montreal Process, uh, was, was able to uh, participate and help host the, uh, I think it was the, the 14th World uh, Forest Congress in, in Turkey. Uh, so many opportunities uh, working with the UN and uh, uh, through my working with the UN I got to learn a whole new language which which is UNE's uh, they they have a different way of speaking they have a different way of writing uh, and and it, it 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 really helped me uh, learn patience since nothing moves quickly in the UN and uh, it had to learn about that and had to accept that. International Forest Industry Roundtable was a, a project started by Sweden. Uh, uh, the Sweden Forest Industry Association invited uh, a, a associations from around the world to come together and discuss forestry, uh, share ideas, uh, what have you. Uh, what, what, what that blossomed into is uh, what, what we called the International Forest Industry Roundtable, IFIR. Uh, and it, it, it bounced around the world, different uh, national associations hosting uh, the the IFIR we 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 ultimately came up with a, a set of uh, criteria and indicators for sustainable forestry that all of us could adhere to, and when I say all of us, it included uh, most of the associations in in Europe, Northern Europe, the U.S., Canada. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and uh, uh, Brazil. So all in all, we represented about 80% of the uh, production of forest products in the world. So it, it was a pretty substantial organization. I mean, the, the, the the, the commonality between the countries is we were all foresters. We, we all want to do the right thing. Um, what is the right thing is uh, a little bit of a difference between countries. Uh, what's amazing in Europe is forestry is so accepted by the, the broad general public that uh, uh, most of the the uh, industry and private landowners over there don't even think about conflict with with uh, environmental organizations. Uh, most of them thought it was appalling that you actually wrote a letter to a a uh, a congressperson uh, complaining about something because that 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 just wasn't polite. Uh, you, 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 same, same situation in, in, uh, New, New Zealand and Australia. Australia had, had conflicts with, uh, Greenpeace, uh, similar to, uh, some of, some of the conflicts we had with environmental organizations. Uh, Chile, uh, completely different animal because most, most of the land was, was public land and, uh, they were harvesting aggressively, and they were they were just starting to think about best management practices. But like I said at the get-go, uh, we were all foresters. We all wanted to do the right thing, so that that brought us together. Chile learned from our BMPs. Uh, uh, we we learned from uh, the the Europeans uh, about some advanced practices and and op operation 
uh, techniques that that really could have Im- really improved our forest operations in the, in the U.S. Uh, economically. Uh, they 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 know what they're doing over there, and they 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 manage every single acre of forest land. The the international trade. Uh, portion of my job was a lot of fun because uh, instead of just uh, working with our U.S. Congress, I, I I had opportunities like to go to China or Japan and uh, work with uh, their policymakers and tr- try to help them understand what what the SFI was about, um, why uh, U.S. forest products were a a good thing, uh, why building with wood was a good thing, which it was a real challenge in, in places like Japan. They, they didn't like building with wood products because they didn't think they were safe. So uh, when, when, whenever there was a big earthquake over in Japan, we sent our code, code and engineering people over there to see how wood structures did compared to uh, cement structures and it was always superior uh, wood wood goes with the shake it doesn't it doesn't fall down so we we made some tremendous strides in Japan with with wood building and uh, that that was good for the US industry since they're a major importer of uh, US wood products Pincho Institute I was lucky enough to I, I guess I'm lucky enough to have served on their their board of directors. The Pincho Institute is a public-private partnership. Uh, public being the Forest Service, uh, private being in individuals like me. Uh, that was established by uh, President Kennedy in 1962, and it was it it was a way to uh, bring the public together to to. Uh, understand forestry and the Pinch, Pincho Institute's job was to be a think tank and uh, consider the the forest policy issues of the day and uh, write reports in a way, in a manner that uh, the, the public could understand and uh, uh, serve as a venue for, for debate amongst professionals over uh, different policy issues. Uh, really interesting board because it, it, it was so diverse. It, it wasn't just foresters. Uh, it was a mix of uh, uh, people from the public, professional foresters. There was always somebody from the Pinchot family on the board, which was very, very cool. And uh, the, the headquarters was at Gray Towers, which was Gifford Pinchot's uh, residence uh, when when he was in Pennsylvania, governor of Pennsylvania, and it, it was his family residence. Just a, a gorgeous place. So it, it was very cool to be able to meet there with the board and uh, feel the present presence of Gifford Pinchot and uh, try to do the important work of being a, a think tank on, on forestry issues. What what helped me with the Pincho Institute is is being involved with really smart people that had uh, different points of view, and uh, so it, it 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 it's it's another one of these opportunities that helped teach me patience and uh, the ability to to listen and and debate. Uh, frustrating at times because I'm always right. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was, it, 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 it just helped, helped me understand how to be, how to be thoughtful and, and work with people that were really, really smart that had a different point of view, which, which, which really happens in DC generally. Um, even though we, we debated heartily with, many environmental groups in, in D.C. In D.C., they're all pros. And at, at the end of the day, we could 
put our arguments behind us and go sit down and have a beer and be polite. Uh, as you come back to the state level, not so much. Resources for the future, an, a, another think tank in, uh, in D.C. R, RFF has been around, uh, I, I think, since the 1940s. Uh, again, really smart people. Uh, I was on the, uh, the Forestry and Natural Resources Advisory Board, so uh, I got to help out uh, that part of their program uh, as far as w w what were the issues of the day, what, what should they be researching. Uh, we didn't get uh, uh, mixed up in the, what results they came up with. Uh, because we we all wanted RFF to be absolutely independent, hire the be the best, most thoughtful people to do the research, and uh, come out with the reports. And it was another situation where I was around the table with really really smart people, and they were they were uh, almost all foresters or natural resource professionals, and and uh, so the, the discussions there were were very enlightening. The, the first American Forest Congress was in the early 1900s. It was set up by uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, and it, 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 it brought together uh, Forest Service and uh, private land managers, and it, and it really led to a sea change in forestry in the U United States. And that sea change was reforestation. Uh, folks like uh, uh, George Weyerhaeuser were there and made the commitment to start reforesting uh, the land after timber harvesting. So a big leap uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, uh, they, over, over the years, uh, it, it's not a, a, a regular uh, schedule. Uh, somebody comes up with the idea of a forest congress, and uh, lucky during my time in D.C. that uh, it was Weyerhaeuser that really kicked it off together with uh, a Yale University to uh, organize the Seventh American Forest Congress. I was on the board of directors helping the, to organize the whole thing. Uh, we must have had five, six hundred people attend from uh, all different walks of life. Uh, uh, the environmental community was well represented. Industry was well represented. Uh, organized labor was there, which was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, member, uh, uh, legislative staff from Capitol Hill, a real mix of people and uh, what we did was talk about the issues of the day and some some pathways forward. I I I can't say that uh, a lot of substance uh, came came out of the Seventh American Forest Congress, but relationships did. Uh, people that uh, uh, I had never met before. Uh, I got got to know, got to appreciate, and it it, it became part of my network of uh, friends in in D.C. that could help me get things done. It, it, tensions were were really bad between the environmental community and the and the forest products and this industry and private landowners generally. Uh, so so that that's what really. Uh, uh, provide the incentive for, for Yale and for Weyerhaeuser to work together uh, to uh, pull it off. And Yale's, Yale and Weyerhaeuser have had a longstanding relationship, so it was kind of a, a natural. And then the, the, the board of directors, really diverse, uh, and, and that was a good thing. So lots of different points of view, and uh, they all got on the table with uh, several hundred people that attended. A couple of skill sets that I believe all foresters need to to really excel is the ability to 
to write competently and uh, to to speak publicly and it 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 doesn't come naturally to many foresters that go into forestry be, because they want to work in the woods and be alone but uh, it, in in these days you you need to be able to communicate to the public about what forestry is all about, uh, why you do what you do, and uh, do so in a in a convincing man manner. Uh, so, uh, all foresters should take journalism courses, uh, get on debating teams, uh, use every opportunity to to speak in public and and get comfortable. Uh, really essential. When I was, I was fortunate at Humboldt State, I decided to take uh, several journalism classes, mainly because I was chasing a girl that was a journalism major. But uh, it, it helped me out enormously. Society of American Foresters, beginning to end. Uh, I didn't join SAF when I was in school. Uh, uh, Humboldt State University had a fantastic forestry club, and it, it really overshadowed all the, the SFI, SAF activities. Um, so it, it, not many people joined SAF uh, at Humboldt while they were students. It was uh, in 1979 when I was just starting out at at the American Forest Products Company where my bosses Bob Maben and Warren Carlton encouraged me to get involved in SAF and you know at that time in your career if your your bosses suggest something uh, you jump and uh, I jumped and joined and uh, became uh, eventually became chapter chair uh, worked at the uh, NorCal so society level on the on the policy level, uh, on the policy committee. Uh, when I moved to Washington D.C., immediately got involved in the in the National Capital SAF. That, that's a society unto itself, and uh, in in in. D.C. is just incredible. It, 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 it was monthly luncheons, and you might get a congressman to speak. You, you might get the CEO of an environmental organization to speak. Uh, some, some very powerful players, and everybody that was anybody that was a forester in D.C. went to the, to the SAF luncheons. So tremendous networking opportunity uh, getting to getting to know folks i mean the the first person i i met was uh, roger sedjo who was uh, the lead person at resources for the future uh, in in forestry research and you know quite a few years older than than me but uh, took the time to talk to me uh, tell me about dc and this was this first meeting, I was a rookie. I didn't, I didn't have a job yet, so it, 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 it felt good to start, start meeting folks. Uh, eventually, I, I worked through the, the chairs at uh, National Capital SAF, and uh, then in, I guess, 1995, decided to, to run for council. And uh, uh, believe it or not, I lost that election, but I won the council seat because the guy who won uh, took a job outside of, of uh, uh, what is it, um, region, region 7 is what I represented. So he had to step down, and I, I got put in. So I, I backed into my, my first council seat. Uh, we're working on uh, council was a real experience. Um, I uh, 
because of my training in the association, I, I knew strategic thinking was really important. And when, when you're on a board of an organization or a council of an organization, you, you don't worry about the day-to-day -day stuff. You, you, you give broad direction. Uh, council was really interesting because it was uh, comprised of people like, a few people like myself that had senior level uh, positions and lots of folks that were more field forestry stuff that just want to get into the nuts and bolts and uh, had a tough time thinking uh, strategically. But we started making that transition uh, and, and everybody tried to pitch in to, to get the council or the board now uh, to, to think more strategically and big, big picture. So in, in, in 1999, uh, I was ready to rotate off the board. I decided to, to run for uh, vice president, uh, and, I, and I did so. I ran against uh, Mike Moore, uh, who was uh, a, a, he was in the state forestry programs in the, in the Lake States, and it was a very tight race. Uh, one of the uh, there's been tighter since then, but I, I, out of 5,000 votes, I won by about 70. So it was really, really close. But I'm, I'm very happy that I was, was able to uh, win that election and go on to be uh, uh, SAF VP and ultimately uh, president in, in 2001. Terrific experience. Got to travel all over the country, uh, meet folks. Got to stir up the stuff with uh, uh, with the rednecks. Uh, who uh, one of the things I, I was trying to promote is making SAF a more inclusive organization, not 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 just for females and, my, and minorities, but uh, any natural resource professional. And uh, boy, did I get pushback. Uh, the, the Bubba's in the South um, wanted it to be an exclusive club. And, and, and that's their right. SAF had always been an exclusive club. And boy, did I get taken to the woodshed whenever I visited some of our, our southern brethren that, that wanted SAF to remain an exclusive club. I'm, I'm very happy with the direction that uh, SAF is, is taking, uh, trying to be more inclusive. There's still resistance, but uh, we, we started the dialogue back in the early 2000s, and it's, it, I think it's starting to pay off. Lead, leadership of, of SAF was was a challenge because it, 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 it really is more diverse than any other organization I'd been involved with. But uh, what I've learned uh, through experience and leadership training is picking two or three priorities that you're going to advocate um, and and push those, uh, and uh, don't try to be politically correct. Uh, just push them, lay lay them out on the table, get the get the dialogue going. Um, my issues were uh, diversity, uh, communications, and and policy. Those, those those three things I wanted SAF to focus on during during my time, and the. The policy and the communications weren't weren't all that controversial. The the diversity was, and I I just laid it out there and and kept pushing it, no matter what the audience was. And if I got that negative feedback, got taken out the woodshed, that that's okay. Um, but just keep uh, putting it out there. Uh, I I really enjoyed writing the uh, uh, editorials from the president. I, I 
I wrote those every other month. Uh, some of my favorite things to look back on and, and read and and see the uh, the letters to the editor that, that came back. Um, uh, you know, one of, one, of, one of the things I said in one of my editorials was um, from a uh, from the movie South Pacific, we know what you're against. What are you for? And uh, that's what I was dealing with in SAF, a bunch of people that just wanted to say no instead of trying to come up with a, with a solution. But it, it was a blast. I recommend it to everybody. Uh, start from the beginning, CLFA, SAF split, never should have happened. And uh, it, it, I, I think that was a function of personalities and perceptions when it, when, when it happened. It, 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 it just wasn't smart. Um, I mean, the perception that uh, SAF didn't represent uh, foresters on uh, California issues at the, at the state level and uh, they probably didn't as hard uh, as, as much as they could have but if CLFA members had got more engaged with SAF they, they could have changed that all around. Uh, as, at, SAF state societies have a lot of flexibility to uh, operate at the state level, and I, I, I've seen that across the country since uh, since I was pres. Um, so it, it, I was I was really disappointed when that s split happened. I when Anna and I first moved back to uh, to California, tried to bring them together, have a, a single administrator, uh, tried to uh, get them to. Uh, come up with a dues structure so uh, both parties won but uh, really didn't go anywhere and uh, uh, Anna, Anna and I both belong to CLFA and, and SAF because that that's the right thing to do but uh, I, I wish more foresters would do that and we're, we're all but retired so um, Paying those two sets of dues, uh, it comes up to uh, a, a significant chunk of change, but it, all, all foresters should do that. Foresters are like Marines. You, you're always a Marine. So if you're a forester, you're always a forester, and you have a responsibility to support your professional organizations. Membership was one of my, uh, my, my major issues when I was prez. Um, matter of fact, I implemented the the Heisenbuttle challenge, which was uh, whichever school could recruit the most SAF members would uh, win a, a five thousand dollar grant from SAF. Uh, and I'll be darned if Humboldt State didn't win, but it it, it was good. It it generated uh, several hundred new members, uh, mainly student members, which. Uh, we need the students. That that's the vitality of our our organization. It was the 2001 national convention. That was my national convention as president. Uh, the the leadership meetings started on September 10th, 2001. Um, 2000, September 11th, uh, 2001, we were all huddled around TVs uh, looking at what had transpired in uh, New York City and Washington, Washington D.C. as a result of the terror, terrorist attacks. Um, be, because they were, uh, the convention started out with leadership committee meetings, not many folks had had arrived yet. Uh, there were about 300 out of the 1,600 folks that uh, made it to Denver. Uh, we had a decision to make. Uh, should we uh, cancel uh, the national convention? 
uh, should we reschedule? Uh, and a, a handful of us from the leadership sat down and talked about it, and we decided we had to cancel the national convention. That had never happened before. And uh, also decided that for the 300 or so of us that were there, we'd, uh, we'd rebundle the, the agenda and celebrate as we could celebrate and, and show those evil bastards that uh, they weren't going to keep us down. Um, anyway, we, we, we went on with the, the 300. We recognized uh, all, all the awardees that most of them couldn't show up. Uh, we, we published all, all the papers that were to be given that weren't. Uh, we, we have a set of pr proceedings from, uh, from uh, that convention. Uh, which, which I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, anyway, uh, that that was the most difficult point in uh, in my participation with uh, with SAF. It, scary too, because Anne hadn't flown out yet, and she was working on Capitol Hill. So very very scary, and all all the phone lines were. Uh, boogered up, so I uh, couldn't get through for about a half a day to find out what the heck was going on. But pandemonium in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the, the, the 2000 National Convention, that was the centennial, and I was, I, I was convention chair. So I, I, I led the group that, that organized the whole thing. It was a blast. Big, big party. Um, I only insisted on one thing, and that was uh, the event would open with a, a marching band, uh, which it did. Uh, we, we got the kids from uh, Eastern High School in Washington, D.C., who are pretty well known for their dance routines and uh, their, their antics when they march. And uh, anyway, that that opened up the convention, and we 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 had a a, a formal ball to uh, celebrate the SAF centennial. Uh, my my mother, my stepdad, my grandmother came, uh, which was really super. Okay, in uh, let me think of the year. 2006, uh, we had a reorganization at, at uh, American Forest and Paper Association, and I was one of the ones reorganized out, which which is fine. I was about to uh, uh, pull the pin anyway. Um, when when whenever a forester loses their job. They automatically become a consulting forester, which is what I did. And uh, my my boss at AF and PA and I formed a, a partnership and actually a, a, a C corporation called Phoenix Strate Strategic Solutions Inc. And uh, and I'll use PSS for now. Uh, PSS, what our, what our, our fundamental uh, business plan was, was to take the learnings from the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and all of the in, incredible public opinion research we, we had done and, and bring that to other industries. Uh, we worked with the pork industry, the fisheries industry, uh, I, I had a, a long-term job with the uh, biomass community, uh, particularly purpose-grown agricultural crops that could be used for uh, making biofuel. And, and, and we actually formed a, a, an organization called the uh, uh, Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Biomass Council. Uh, with 
a, a diversity of members. It, in, it, in, it included uh, many within the, the industry as well as environmental organizations like the Nature Conservancy, Natural Resource Defense Council, um, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, just, just to talk about how to develop a sustainability plan for purpose-grown biomass crops that, that might be replacing other agricultural crops, uh, might, might be replacing grasslands, what have you, uh, trying to get a, ahead of the curve. So that, that was a lot of fun, uh, uh, trying to help a, a new industry. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, the, the whole time I, I, I consulted with them, the folks in the industry says, oh, our technology is about five years off turning biomass into biofuel. That was 10 years ago. Today, it's still about five years off. And the, the, the price of uh, oil, a barrel of oil, has just tanked. So uh, biofuel's not looking so good these days. But it, it, it was a good learning experience, and it, it paid the bills. And I, I did some consulting work for SAF during that time. I, I helped them uh, uh, write a, a, a book called the, uh, the State of America's Forests, and I'll show you that. that it's on my table. Uh, there was a good piece of work, and now at SAF has established itself as the keeper of data on U.S. forests. And uh, I just just heard that uh, they're in the process of updating that report, which is a good thing. That, anyway, if Phoenix Strategic Solutions still exists, I own 500 shares. My partner, business partner Steve Lovett, owns 500 shares, and we 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 haven't officially closed down the the shop yet. Uh, my rule is, if somebody wants to pay me an incredible amount of money. For something that's fun to do, then we'll 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 start the band again with with Phoenix. But for now, it's it's kind of laying idle. What one of the more interesting jobs that uh, we had with uh, uh, Phoenix Strategic Solutions PSS is. Uh, one of my buddies that I've, I've met through the association started his own consulting business. He was a wildlife biologist, and he was helping the coal industry, uh, not just the coal industry, the, the strip mining industry, uh, come up with a, a plan for sustainability. And what it, it sounds counterintuitive, but... Uh, it, D despite what their practices look like, uh, the the coal companies are required uh, to rehabilitate that land at, after they've taken the coal. And therein lies the opportunity for doing something good for Mother Nature. And uh, uh, up until my my wildlife biologist buddy was involved, the 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 coal miners would reclaim everything, pull the, the the soil back over the top of the pits, and spread grass seed, and it'd come back. It'd look green and pretty and all that, but they were missing an opportunity to to really uh, enhance the wildlife habitat, enhance the the biological diversity, and that that's what the coal industry hired him and me uh, to do is try to come up with some sort of plan to do a better uh, job of uh, rehabilitating. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had a change of presidents in the United States, and the, the immediate former president uh, had a war on coal, and uh, essentially all the coal companies went broke. So <laughs> uh, no more job there, but I, 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 I thought it was fun. Uh, sitting down with a bunch of strip miners and trying to do the right thing. Since uh, moving back to uh, 
California. I, I've become very involved in the community and, and uh, uh, doing volunteer work. A uh, couple of things I do. Uh, first, I've become a Board of Supervisors groupie. I, I go to every single Board of Supervisors meeting, and uh, when, when there's something on the agenda that has to do with natural resources, uh, I say something. Uh, not many people take the opportunity to really get to know their Board of Supervisors, uh, County Board of Supervisors. It, it's worth doing because you can, at the, at the local level, you can, you can have a tremendous amount of influence in it. And uh, once they start recognizing you as a natural resource expert, uh, they they start listening to you, so uh, it it it's a real opportunity that I recommend for everybody. Uh, other volunteer work I've, I've been doing is uh, an organization called the Amador Calaveras Consensus Group, which was started in around 2009. Uh, uh, a board of supervisor in Calaveras County. Uh, got together some environmental groups and industry folks to help help mitigate the local forest wars over uh, forest management on na national forest lands in on the El Dorado and the and the Stanislaus National Forest. Uh, good group. Uh, there's about 30 or 40 of us that participate once a month. We take a look at forest service projects. We've uh, uh, secured funding from the Forest Service uh, uh, for uh, the local collaborative. Um, it, 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 it's still up and running. Very painful process because it, it's slow. But it has served to reduce some of the conflict in the local area, which is a, a good thing. I, I mean, I've... It, I'd be dreaming if, if I thought the Forest Service would ever get back to real active forest management, but if you can avoid lawsuits uh, over passive forest management, uh, I think we're doing okay. Uh, another group uh, I'm a founder of is the uh, uh, Calaveras Amador Forestry Team, the Calam Forestry Team. A uh, group of uh, volunteers, mainly uh, mainly professional foresters. There, there's uh, four of us that uh, form the group uh, uh, to respond to, to some grants that Cal Fire was was uh, offering, uh, funded with the S S SRA uh, tax money. Um, and uh, wanted to secure that money to, to help out uh, both Amador and Calaveras County. So we've been, uh, we've been very active in grant writing. All, all total in the two years we've been operating, we've, we've uh, put in for about $9 million worth of grants and we've secured about $6 million uh, for uh, fuels reduction work uh, for restoration of the, the Butte fire area. Uh, so we've, we've been very successful and we've, we've made a good name for ourselves uh, in, in both counties and we'll just keep plugging along. Uh, people think we're insane, not, not charging anything for what we do, but uh, want to be able to give back to the community and think we, we think that's really important. Our, our rule is uh, we, we write the grants, we don't implement. So uh, it, in most of the grants, uh, we build in money for a consulting forester at, where, where it's needed and uh, uh, let, let the counties or the fire safe council, whoever we're writing the grant for, uh, hire whoever uh, wants to... Uh, to do the work. Uh, when I when I moved back to D.C., I said I'm not not going to hike up up and down hills anymore. So that that's our rule. We write. You guys implement.
we we haven't officially done workshops on grant writing, but uh, we we've helped others uh, write grants. That, for example, the the Amador Resource Conservation District uh, and uh, CalAM team coordinated on writing uh, four different grants for Amador County. Uh, we did the writing. Uh, RCD uh, submitted a couple of them. Uh, our Fire Safe Council submitted another couple of them. So we, we're, we're, we're trying to help other people understand how to do it. And we did, did the same for a, a group up in Alpine County that is, is trying to emulate the uh, Amador Calaveras consensus group. They needed a, needed a grant to, to get going. So uh, we we provided them help in in writing their grant, which which they secured. That was a good thing. Amateur Fire Safe Council. I'm on the board of directors. Uh, I'm the treasurer. Uh, interesting group. There's a, a a couple of us that are professional foresters on the group. Other the rest of them are interested citizens. Uh, uh, in, one's an insurance agent, which is a good perspective to have when you're you're talking about fire. Another one's uh, the 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 chief at the volcano telephone office, so he knows communications, which is an asset for the fire safe council. Um, I I I got involved because. Um, I like what they're doing, uh, re reducing fire hazard. Uh, and I finally volunteered to be on the board because they were in desperate need of a, a treasurer, somebody that knew how to, how to uh, uh, make the books work and uh, un understand budgets. And uh, so I've been doing that for a couple of years. It blew my mind for, for seven or eight years they operated with no budget, nothing on paper, just whatever came in, came in. We've, we've changed that. Very cool award. Um, it's it's uh, given every other year like the uh, uh, Pinchot Medal. And uh, uh, Sir William Schleck was a, a forester for the United Kingdom back when the UK had an empire. And uh, he, he traveled through all the colonies in the late 1800s preaching forestry, reforestation, uh, professional forest management. And that the award is given to an individual that has had a significant impact on uh, domestic and international forest policy. So. Uh, it it was very nice to get that award. Uh, it, it, it's recognition of a body of work, and I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to uh, to practice forestry domestically and and internationally. Amador El Dorado Forest Farm was established uh, back in the 1940s. Uh, it, 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 forest forums were actually created throughout the state of California back in the 40s, and it was it was an outgrowth of SAF trying to relate to to local citizens. And what Amador El Dorado Forest Forum is uh, an opportunity for just uh, local citizens, a lot of loggers, um, foresters and women in timber types, uh, forest service folks come together once a month and our, our whole purpose for being is to raise money for scholarships for uh, kids going to forestry school. And uh, uh, Amador El Dorado Forest Forum it may be one of the last in existence in California. I don't, I don't know of any of the others, but uh, Ann and I got involved again uh, once we moved back to D.C. When, when we were uh, 
in California during the 70s and 80s, we were very active in the Forest Forum, and I, I was chair for a while. Um, we have a speaker. We uh, raise money through, uh, uh, through auctions and, and raffles. And we, we usually end up giving a, a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks a year to uh, somebody going to forestry school. They must they must be a junior or more at one of the the, the recognized schools. So it, it it's it's a lot of fun and it's a it's another opportunity to network and keep the network going. Uh, the the CLFA breakfast meetings uh, it. It's, it's all foresters, all members of, of CLFA. We get together once a month uh, for breakfast down in Jackson and shoot the bull. Uh, uh, talk about the, the issues affecting uh, RPFs in, in California. Uh, do a lot of whining about what CAL FIRE and the Board of Forestry is, is up, up to that month. Um, and uh, just just trade stories, and again, a good opportunity to network. Have I said network enough times? Yes. That's and very important in this profession. Got to have fun. Uh, two of my passions are are hunting and fishing. I've I've been a I've been both all my life, a hunter and a fisherman. Uh, Bought a boat with my uh, stepdad a few years back, so always make the time to uh, to to wet wet the line. Uh, Ann and I uh, travel to Alaska annually now. Uh, we decided we'd do that while we still can, and uh, fish up in Alaska. If 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 you if you haven't gone to Alaska and you're a you're a fisherman. You need to go. It's 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 beyond description. Uh, hunting. I'm very fortunate that my uh, my wife likes to hunt. Uh, both both my brothers like to hunt. So uh, uh, we we make the make the time to do that. It it can't be all work. You got to make time to have fun. Uh, right up the hill here uh, is uh, Bureau of Land Management land so uh, in a five minute walk you can be on legal legal hunting ground my nephew got his first buck last year up there so that was that was fun and i uh, need to mention my two black labs they they love bird hunting so and we belong to a pheasant club so uh, they always look for, forward to, to uh, pheasant season and and getting out there to romp and hopefully their mom and dad don't miss the pheasants. They don't understand missing. Biggest changes I've seen in, in forestry over my career, there, there's two. Uh, one is the, the transition of the of the U.S. Forest Service from an organization that actively manages their forest lands to an organization that passively manages their forest lands. Enormous change and uh, lots of repercussions. It, it uh, not only wiped out a good portion of the forest products industry in the West, but it, it, it created an enormous fire hazard uh, that, that we all have to deal with. Uh, so we, we, that's been a radical change. The, the other radical change I've seen is the, the change in forest land, private forest land ownership over the past 15 or 20 years, where land traditionally owned by the forest products industry, companies like International Paper, Weyerhaeuser, uh, Plum Creek, have switched to ownership by TIMOs, Timber Industry Management Organizations. Uh, TIMOs do not operate uh, the way traditional forest products companies 
operated uh, traditional companies uh, saw their land as an asset for growing trees. Timos uh, look for the highest and best use. Highest and best use might be a subdivision. Uh, so uh, representing Timos was much different for an association than uh, representing uh, traditional forest products companies. And, and the impl imp implications for land management uh, change dramatically with that change. Heck, look at look at Weyerhaeuser now. They they split off all their land into a Timo. Uh, they bought out uh, Plum Creek. Uh, so now the 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 largest private forest land owner in the U.S. is is the Weyerhaeuser Timo, which has about 16 million acres. Huge. Con conversion of forest land to non-forest land, that, that, that's a big issue. I mean, it, uh, traditional forest products companies would, would look at uh, investment in trees over the long haul, you know, 40, 60 year rotation. Um, Timos need to answer to their stockholders, board of directors, every single year. They need to, they need to make uh, six, seven, eight percent. And in order to do that, you, you can't depend on just your timber asset. You, you have to look at real estate. And so there, there's a, a lot of land conversion occurring. And these are private landowners, so they, they have the right to do that. But if, if, if you're a forester, it's, it's a little disquieting to, to see land converted to, to houses that'll never be forest land again. I think it's happening more in the South. In the South. Um, where, uh, if, if you look at re retirement trends, uh, a lot of folks are moving to the South because, because weather is good. Uh, taxes are very favorable, so uh, uh, th that's where a lot of the forest land conversion is is happening. You th you, th you think about California, there there aren't many places uh, left that that are forest land that uh, are, are are good for con conversion to to something else. So I I, I don't see it as a a big issue in California. And with, I mean, think about it. Sierra Pacific Industries is the the largest forest landowner in the in California, and they're 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 family owned. They're a, they're a, a, an S corp. Uh, they're not under any of the same pressures to convert forest land to some other use because it's just red in the boys. Okay, a couple, a couple of different things. Um, one, of, one of the most important pieces of advice I got right out of forestry school from an older forester is you're, you're a college kid. You don't know shit. Just listen and watch and learn. Uh, and I took that to heart. I mean, the, it, uh, he took me to a... A, a logging side. I had, I had needed to. They were without a, a a chaser on the logging side, so I got volunteered to to be chaser on the the landing. And I just listened to the logger, and I didn't spout off, and uh, listened and learned. Um, the the other piece of it. Two more pieces of advice. Join SAF. Start your network. Uh, it's it's really really important, and uh, work your tail off. Uh, volunteer to do more. Uh, put in the hours. Uh, demonstrate to your boss that that, that you want to work hard. Uh, it, 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 and if if you work hard, it pays off. It's the responsibility of every professional forester to to join Society of American Foresters. It it's just something you have to do. 
not only to uh, Im- Im- improve yourself, keep yourself up to up up to speed on the the science of the day, but the the networking is so incredible. Um, when you when you work for the private sector, uh, like I did through it, throughout my career, uh, you can be fired any day. That's the risk you take. Um, I never worried about it because of my SAF network. Uh, I, I, I knew I'd have a job the next day uh, because of the contacts I made through SAF. So it, it, it's well worthwhile for for any any uh, fledgling professional to get involved with. I gotta say, Bob Maben, uh, Warren Carlton. Uh, who are both with American uh, Forest Products Company. Uh, from a communications standpoint, uh, Luke Popovich, who helped me with my writing style. I thought I was a good writer going into D.C. Um, after seeing Luke edit my stuff, I realized I had a lot to learn. Uh, and I'd have to say Steve Lovett, who was my boss at AFPA and my business partner now, uh, taught me a lot about, uh, he was in, into international trade and he taught me a lot about how to handle myself internationally. Let's take California first. Uh, to me, California is almost hopeless. Uh, the, the the regulations are out of control. It's it's hard to practice forestry in this state. Uh, al- although the the uh, the board and many of my environmental friends would deny this, the regulations have really pushed uh, industrial forest landowners into very aggressive forest management, even age forest management uh, and it's the regulations that cause that cause that because you you, you can't a- afford to do it any other way uh, they pushed industry into aggressive really aggressive forest management and they they pushed non-industrial landowners out of forest management because if, if you own less than 40 acres you really can't afford to do a, a timber harvest plant What's wrong with that picture? But one of the reasons we have the huge fire danger that we have is people can't afford to, to manage their forest lands to reduce uh, fuel, uh, fuel loads, what have you. That's California. Um, more optimistic about uh, the rest of the United States. Uh, working with AFPA, I, I, I got to visit almost every state in the union, and and see their forest practices. And the, the the forest practices, with or without a forest practice act, are excellent. Uh, people care about their forest land, uh, whether they're non-industrial landowners or industrial landowners. They they've got a passion for taking care of their their land, and um, as the as the private sector has been restricted in in California and uh, timber harvest has been reduced on public lands, the the southern part of the United States and Canada has really sucked it up and uh, started to to manage more intensively and and, uh, uh, supply our our need for forest products, so um, which provides financial incentive for those landowners to keep their forest lands as forest lands, which is a good thing for foresters. So I'm optimistic about the rest of the country. Ideal forest would be something that was uneven age managed, but intensively managed. Uh, Even age management, doesn't take a whole lot of smarts. Uh, 
uh, uneven age management, which which we we did with the American Forest Products Company, uh, takes a lot more smarts. But as it, as I mentioned earlier, it it's tough to do these do that these days in California because of the forest practice regulations and the 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 cost of the of forest land ownership. But that'd be my perfect world. <laughs>